First of all, even though my people invented prophecy, they wrote a book about it, I believe. <laughs> I'm not a prophet. Uh, I can make some calculated assumptions and based on what we are knowing, uh, to make some a little bit some judgment or at least present my point of view. There are dramatic changes in the region. They are not yet, those processes are not yet stopped. They are continuing. And it's very hard to define what would be the outcome of it. And I believe the region started to define itself with different alliances. And let's not forget that radical elements that used to be once in the region disappeared completely. Saddam Hussein is not anymore with us. Gaddafi is not here. Salah in, in Yemen, who was usually very much against Israel, is not now in power. Hadir, Hadir was replacing him. And even in Sudan, Bashir uh, said that he is not going to run again for the presidency in Sudan. Then many of the radical Islamic, uh, the radical Islamic leadership disappear completely. And we are facing, I'll be a little bit more optimistic, with a less confronting Arab League. People are trying always to define the worst case scenario. I believe the situation is not becoming worse. And the best use of time is not by sitting and waiting, but to create initiative and seek opportunities. I think that the fear of the worst case scenario will stop eventually us from achieving a different Middle East. I think that today, in our world, the interests of Israel, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf countries, and even the Palestinians to a certain extent, and even Egypt, lies together. The borders between inside the Islam are defined differently, not based on political agenda, but on religious agenda. I'm not saying that the political agenda disappeared completely, but what we are saying the last more than 10 years, even, even uh, longer, an open conflict between the Shia and the Sunni that is tearing up the Arab world and the Muslim world. I think that this is creating unique opportunities for Israel to seek different alliances and to reassure our presence in the Middle East. Let's take, for instance, an example, the Arab proposal. Not every aspect of it I like, but as a starting point to sit down and discuss it, it's a vital, I believe, a vital necessity for Israel to do it. If we are looking, for instance, on the Palestinian issue, the Palestinian issue, it's a, a very complicated issue. You really cannot finish all the aspects with the Palestinians. You need the rest of the Arab world. Let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, the Palestinians want to return the Palestinian community back. And naturally, Israel is against it, and I'm really against that refugees will come back to Israel. You need that, first of all, Arab countries will provide them with citizenship, and second, will provide with the right resources to establish them in a different situation, not in refugee camps like they are living today. Then you need, really, the Arabic world. Let's take the holy places. The holy places are not controlled only by the Palestinians. It's an Islamic issue. You need the support of other Arabic countries to arrange some understanding on issue, very crucial issue like the holy places. And I'm not speaking of all the, it's What I'm trying to say is the problem are much more complicated. And to try to finish every aspect bilaterally by a direct dialogue, not always is successful. I think that in this period of time, people are describing the threat from Iran. I agree, Iran doesn't like us, and they are see us as an ideological uh, enemy, and we are the front uh, fortress of the Western ideology in the Middle East, and this is something that is becoming a threat to them. 
But if we are looking at the situation of Iran, they are in a, in a very serious situation. Let's look internally in Iran. The public, let's look on issue like inflation. The inflation is unbelievable. Let's look about unemployment. Let's look about who is holding key element of the economy and try to imagine a system that instead of putting the right capable people on head of those organizations, they are putting the, the manager to run those businesses based on loyalty. Then we are reaching to a situation where it's not functioning the right way. Look at the problem of energy and electricity that the Iranians are suffering. Look at the issue of the minorities inside Iran. And even though we are saying we are, you have a tendency to describe that everything lies in the hand of Khamenei, there is a dialogue, there is always a listening of the leadership in which direction the public is going. It's not an empty dialogue. It's not always a, an official dialogue. But there is a dialogue. The leader cannot rule out and regard what the population is presenting it. And I believe the fact that Rouhani was chosen, I don't think that he was the first priority of Khamenei. If I look on the people who participate in the election, Kalibar was a much better choice from his point of view. And a few others were much more preferred by Khamenei than Rouhani. And the people who united behind Rouhani, from my point of view, are much more important than Rouhani himself because they have a force to have an impact on him, even though that in crucial issues like security and foreign policy, it lies in the hand of the, the leader Khamenei. Let's look around the world. They were considering, for instance, to gain a total influence in Iraq. They failed. They were trying to ignite a war between the Shia in Yemen and they are engaging directly with the Saudis in the north part of Yemen. There is a, a minority called the Houthis, and they are Shia. They are supported by the Iranian, and they are not successful. Let's look on the Syrian issue. From their point of view, it's a, a crucial issue, because if they are not going to win the conflict in Syria, we can shut down the organization of the Hezbollah, and it's a very important tool in the hand of the Iranian to maneuver and to get influence, political influence in the region. I think there is more opportunities than people are realizing. I think that if we are not going to take the initiative, especially with the Arab world, especially today, and people probably will make remarks, look, Egypt is run by the Muslim Brotherhood. But if you look, I believe they took over because one reason, they were very well organized. They were always already penetrated into the basic fabric of society by running the social activities. As such, it was easy for them to translate it to political power. But is this system successful? The answer is no. We suddenly saw a process in Egypt that I never imagined that it will come. People were cheering Mubarak when he was considered the most worst dictator they ever faced. Then if I'm looking what's happening in Libya or in Tunisia by those radical Islamic organizations that took over the country, they are not successful. They are receiving on daily basis, they are criticized by the majority of the public, and I'm not sure they are going to survive. Economically, they are not carrying what I call a real message to the people. They are in a serious situation. If you are looking on the behavior of Morsi himself, he is trying with the best effort that he can do not to touch the agreement with Israel. He is very much dependent on the money that he is receiving from the United States. He understands that economically, if he is going to continue, uh, it's an unsolved formula in Egypt. And they have to become much more practical than people are realizing. I think that this environment, this situation, even though it does not change, we need to do it. Let me give you another example. Always they are claiming that 
the Jordan kingdom is almost going to fall down. I read articles on King Hussein that the next week he's going to fall down. Let me put it this way, King Abdullah of Jordan, he, I believe he is ruling now the country more time than any prime minister in Israel and more than any president in the United States. They are not only civilians. Try to imagine that if we will hesitate, and we wouldn't sign a peace agreement with Jordan. We will say, look, why we should make a peace agreement with Jordan? The system is going to collapse. The Palestinians will take over. They are going to become the worst enemy of Israel. I think we took a risk, but this risk paid off. I think that if we have to define a policy, I would say that we have to prepare ourselves to the worst, but to take every opportunity and to seek every chance that we can. And if we will not take the initiative and lead, lead the way, the way will be forced upon us. And the prices that we are going to pay will be heavy on every aspect, on the Palestinian issue, with the dialogue with the rest of the Arabic countries. I think we have to seek the opportunities. Thank, Thank you, Mayor Dagan.